It's been a while since we've looked at anything out of the Master Mirror collection, so today I thought we would look at making the hinges that would go on the tool chest from that collection. I'm John Switzer, and you're watching Black Bear Forge. For today's project, I've prepared four pieces of wrought iron. This is old wrought iron. I'm not sure what the original source was. And right now, these are roughly quarter by one, maybe a little bit narrower than that, by about six inches long. So that makes them about six millimeters by 25 millimeters, or would that be 160 millimeters or so? And that'll be enough for a pair of hinges. I think quarter inch might be a little bit thick, and I'll probably try to thin these and widen them out a little bit as we go. Just because old hardware tended to have fairly thin straps, they were trying to make the best use of the material they had on hand. These are unlike most modern hinges that have a hinge pin that everything rotates around. This style of hinge uses a pair of rings that go on at 90 degree angles, and that's what the hinge pivots on. So one ring is in the same plane as the hinge strap, and the ring on the other strap is in the opposite plane. And we're going to form these rings by drawing out a thin tail on the bar and then forge welding it back to make the ring. I have a fire lit in the coal forge, so remember to put on your safety glasses. Let's head over to the anvil and get to work. So we're going to start the first one just by offsetting oh, about an inch there and drawing out a little tail. I don't want to get this end very thin because that's going to have to come back around and forge weld. It actually wants to be thinner back through here. To make the hinge work smoother, I'm going to round this up. I'm not too worried about the very end where it'll weld. I'm going to put a little bevel on that to form a scarf. And then the next heat, we're going to round that up. Something about like that. I'm going to switch to a lighter hammer. This is a pretty small weld. It doesn't need a hammer that big. Now wrought iron welds at a higher heat than mild steel does, so keep that in mind if you've been forge welding mild steel and you're going to wrought iron. It's going to need to be a little bit hotter. Just light little taps to set the weld. I'm going to start thinning this out a little bit, but I don't want to thin the eye out. I want to leave it pretty heavy. This is just kind of a matter of what you want your hinge to look like at this point. I'm going to take a minute and make sure that I get a Another bar through there, that's a 3 8 bar. I think that'll be plenty big enough. So that will fit. Don't do too much forging at a low heat because wrought iron will delaminate if you let it. You see just a little bit of my scarf, so I'm going to go ahead and heat that up and Weld that one more time. I'll weld over an anvil block so that I can keep that eye off the edge there. That should get that down nicely. May need to drift that eye again just because it's not perfectly round. I can put a bigger pin in there. And 
I think before we turn this around, let's punch a couple of holes in it. I'm punching small square holes that will hopefully take nails someday. This punch may be a little too small. Cooling it off frequently. Still bending over at the tip just a hair. This is fairly cold, but I'm shearing the slug out more so than I'm doing anything else. And cold shears pretty well. Also keeps it from deforming quite so badly over the hardy hole. That one didn't fall out completely, but we're pretty close. Having a bolster with an appropriately sized square hole would be very beneficial. I don't have a square one. I guess I'll need to make one. Now this might be narrower than the one in the Master Mirror book. They have double row of holes shown and they don't look this close together. So this may be a fairly narrow hinge. I think one hole at the top would have been plenty. I'm going to go to a bigger drift. This one's about a half inch. it would be about 13 millimeters. That makes a much cleaner looking eye there. So, next thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and thin out the whole thing and get it all down to a more reasonable thickness. We'll draw that down over the horn. I'm going to knock these corners back just a little bit so it rounds off. And then smooth this up. It also lets it flare out a little bit. I'm not sure the originals did, but I kind of like that look. These are not going to be an exact reproduction of the originals. This is just my take on the whole thing. Heavily inspired by, but not a copy of. By working down towards a black heat, we get a lot of the scale off and really leave a nice smooth finish. You're not trying to do any big shaping at that point though, you're just keeping it clean and smooth. Then we're going to need to go ahead and punch some more holes. I think I'll punch two more sets of two holes. These are sized for some fairly small nails. I've done a lot of these for other people that have screw holes in them and just a countersunk flathead screw. So it just depends on what the end user wants. If I ever build a chest to go with it, I'm going to want to use clinch nails because that's the way the original would have been done. This punch is really not happy. 
It's one I usually use cold. But, I thought this was just too heavy to punch cold. Shearing the slugs out isn't the same thing as punching cold. I think those need to be enlarged just a little bit to make them the same size as the others. Two more holes and we ought to have it. I think I'll go ahead and put my touch mark on the back of this instead of on the front. So that is all that strap needs. You want to clean it up with a file and get the edges more even. I think you can do that. When we're all done, this may need to be contoured. This is the top strap, the one that will go on the top of the chest. Or at least that's the way I think I would do it. So it may have to fit a curved chest top. But for now, we'll leave it like it is. Now on this strap, I want to pull that tab or part that will be the ring out of the center because it's going to bend the other direction. I'm going to go ahead and put a little scarf on there. But I'm not going to go ahead and bend that yet. I'm going to leave it straight out so I can finish shaping the hinge, punch the holes in it. And that'll make sense when we get to that weld.
Again, I'm going to kind of round this end over before I finish spreading it and thinning it. I got a little bit there that's going to delaminate. It may have to be filed off in the long run, but we'll see if we can get it to weld back in. It's such a small little chip that I'm not too really not too worried about it. At this point, it's just whatever it is. If it's got a little splinter there, I'll file that off. our first two holes. This is pretty hot on the fingers. And I think I'll survive. I don't need to touch mark both pieces. I'm going to clean this up just a little bit before I punch these holes. You can always come back when you're through and redrift the holes if they aren't just the way you want them. I may screw these top two up doing the forge weld, so I may regret them doing it this way. But if I'm careful with the forge weld, I also might get away with it. I'll just be done punching holes. I say that's hot. So now we need to do that weld. So the first thing is to bend that strap around. And I want to bend it around to the back side. So whichever is the larger side of the hole. So I want to bend it down that way. Oh, I broke it. That's too bad. So that piece isn't going to be usable. Now old wrought iron oftentimes has flaws in it. And that's just one of the risks. A lot of what you get as salvage was never meant for high quality work. It's old bridge iron and stuff like that. It was never meant to be used in such thin pieces. I'll see if I can weld the end of that back together, pull that back a little bit without ruining my nail holes with any luck, and we should still be able to make use of this. 
I suppose we could have done that whole other end first and then drawn this out. It'd be about the same thing as we're doing right now. Get that weld on the end there, get all that put back together better. this up again. A little scarf on the end. That's still a little bit flaky on the end there, but hopefully I can get all that to weld down. It actually decided to rain today. It hadn't rained in ages, or at least not enough to make a difference. I don't want to actually bring this together and weld it yet because I need to attach it to that other piece. So making sure the back sides will go together. I'll put that ring in there and then I can close this down a little bit. I have to be really careful when I do this forge weld that I only weld that little bit of the, the ring and don't weld the two rings together be a real real problem if you do that. Very carefully catch that scarf area. Actually going to then want to offset all of this to the, the front side. And make sure this hinge still functions. It's going to take a little bit of fiddling around probably. That ring could have been a little bit bigger, but it's going to work. I just want all that to the front so that it will behave better in use when it's mounted on the chest. Just trying to get it all in line now. I'm not sure how much that matters. These aren't precision hinges by any means. They're a very simple, very primitive style of hinge. And we didn't mess up our screw holes doing that. Again, I want to make sure that continues to run smoothly. That will wear in over the years as the chest is used. But really, that's about all there is to it. Very simple little forge weld, but you have to be kind of delicate with them. Now, if you want to see how I did the second hinge in this pair of hinges, just rewind to the beginning of the video and watch it all over again. Okay, maybe you can just use your imagination. Really, the procedure is essentially the same for one hinge as it is for two hinges, three hinges, four hinges, however you want to do it. 
although sometimes you learn a few things along the way. For instance, when I did that second loop, the back part right here, I bent that towards the front and then looped, and that way I didn't have to straighten it back out again after the hinge was all done. I do like making sure the forge welds on the back because it doesn't always lay down perfectly. Frequently a little sign that there's a scarf, maybe a little sharp edge from the edge of the scarf. And if it's trapped against the wood of the chest, you're never going to see it, never going to be a problem. So this is the way these work. This one goes on the back of the chest, and it has to be high enough that this one can come across the back. Now these Viking tool chests, like in the Master Mirror book, usually have a little bit of a curved top, and this will need to be shaped to fit that curve. If it's thin enough, and if it's really good solid wrought iron, it's really not a problem to just go ahead and bend this cold a little bit. You can always heat it back up and shape it. If you need to, make a cardboard tracing of the lid of the tool chest, then transfer that to a piece of sheet metal, and you can use that as a guide as you bend it. Really not that hard to do, but it does need to be done kind of custom for each tool chest. And since I'm probably going to use these, I'd like to make the master mirror chest. I'm just going to hold on to it. Once I get the chest done, then I'll do that last little step. Now, some of this wrought iron had some problems. It had some problems splitting and cracking. In fact, the second one, there's some little delaminations and cracks in the wrought iron. And on the back of this first one, there's a little delamination right there. None of that really hurts anything for what these are going to be used for. I am sure if you were making these for sale, there are a lot of customers that really would turn their nose up at something like that. But part of that is the nature of the material. Wrought iron does that sometimes. You do see old wrought iron hardware and fences and gates and rails, things like that that have those characteristics to them. That's just part of what is wrought iron. Now, better wrought iron doesn't do that as much, but this is something that was from an old water tower or a bridge or some other structural wrought iron that was never refined as much as wrought iron that was used for ornamental work. These were generally big pieces, so they didn't need as much refinement to be strong. And I've had to forge these down into smaller bits for the kind of work I do. And generally it's had its problems. But if you get really highly refined wrought iron, really nice stuff, it doesn't do that so easily. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video and are inspired to go make some hardware of your own. Whether they're Viking tool chest hinges or some other kind of hardware, hardware is a great thing to do in the blacksmith shop. And it really doesn't take much material or all that much time. Very basic skills, and in this case, very simple little forge welds. If you did enjoy the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends. If you would like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links down in the video description for both PayPal and Patreon. There is no obligation. Those are merely donations. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.